can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Free and uncorrupted communication. The Department of Black Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, was recently honored to host acclaimed Haitian American writer Edwidge Dantica on June 1st and 2nd, 2004. Edwidge Dantica is an internationally known uh, writer who has received many, many uh, literary accolades uh, for her work. Edwidge Jansika's first book, Breath, Eye, Memory, which um, recounts the story of a young girl uh, immigrating to the United States and is partly autobiographical, uh, was selected as a Oprah Book Club. Uh, her second volume, Creek Crack, uh, was a National Book Award finalist, and she received the 1999 American Book Award, uh, among other uh, prizes that she has received for her work, which has been already translated in over 10 languages, including French, Spanish, German, uh, Finnish, Korean, and Japanese. Um, her most recent work, uh, A Butterfly Away, a collection of writing by Haitians and uh, some children's stories, uh, Behind the Mountains, received a number of prizes in 203. Um, let me, maybe to give you a sense of um, the, the, the positioning of, of this writer, um, use a paraphrase from the protagonist from Behind the Mountains, uh, the young girl Celiane, who says, um, I had this dream after the bombing that I could not remember my name, that I could not remember who I was. I was afraid that nobody would find me. Um, this is typical of what Dantica writes about. She writes about the voiceless, those who have um, no, no face, who have been oppressed uh, for too long, who have suffered violence. Um, Edwidge Dantica's work is about the greater good for humanity in general. She stands up against oppression. She writes about uh, resistance and hope. She writes about ties that binds, about ways of um, being um, working in solidarity uh, with others. She writes about retelling, uh, recounting, remembrance. Um, she is a voice uh, who tells the story of those who are not able to tell uh, their own stories. Um, it is a privilege to have her here with us. Um, there will be right now a conversation between Dr. Marlene Racine Toussaint, a uh, leading feminist who have uh, really stood up for Haitian women for over 40 years in Haiti and outside, and also the founder of uh, Multicultural's Women's Press. So now, Edwidge Dantica and Dr. Marlene Racine Toussaint. I'm Marlene Racine Toussaint, the president of Multicultural Press, a small uh, publishing house. It is my pleasure to introduce today Edwidge Dantica, the illustrious writer of Haitian descent. And um, she's a regents lecturer in the Department of um, Black Studies of the University of Santa Barbara, California. University of California, Santa Barbara. Edwidge, you write fiction. Why? Be um, I write fiction because I love stories and I've had the privilege of always having been told stories and just being caught up in something made up and having no accountability and, and just seeing where your imagination leads you. So I've always loved stories 
stories told, oral stories growing up, and then love reading. So for me, it's a natural, natural progression. So I, I tell lies for a living. <laughs> Uh, but you, you write different genres, like, uh, of course, fiction, and you, you edited several volumes, uh, like The uh, Butterfly's Way, the big, you know, with Big Press, and, uh, and you have a lot of uh, your work has been translated in um, how many languages do you know exactly? Yeah. Um, a few, about ten. ten. In ten languages. languages yes. Do you speak any of the languages <laughs> besides English? And um, just well, I speak some some French, and unfortunately, um, I think the language closest to the work, you know, which is um, Haitian Creole, the work hasn't been translated in in in, in Creole. But um, those are about the only ones I speak, and a little Spanish. But okay, you have two children's book. Oh. You seem to be, you, you like to write children's stories. What's, uh, you know, your relationship with children? Really? Well, I think it, um, it goes back to, to the first question in that I've always, you know, I was introduced to stories as a child. And, and so I'm always interested in, in how children receive a story. And, and also along with, my, with the adult books that I've written, I've always come back either through essays, through writing you know, children's stories. And also it's interesting to observe what happens to children in an immigrant family because they're so, you know, the, the, the experiences of, of parents, of grandparents are so detached from the children who are born here and to see their progression, to see their experience and to even see the, the interaction of the children. So that's why after writing several books for adults, I was curious about, you know, about writing for children and in some ways trying to transport some of our stories to these children who may never know the places we come from, who may never know Haiti, you know, my nieces and, and nephews who are, who range from five to, you know, ten months, don't, won't know Haiti in the same way that my parents did, definitely not in that way, or in the way that I did. So my work, which has sort of slowly progressed towards some work for children, has to do with that, with the fact that of translating or re-relating some of the stories that made me a fiction writer, you know, some of the stories that made me love stories. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir said a writer is someone who has read a lot. Were you an avid writer? I was, um, I mean, I was an avid a reader. reader yes. Words, yeah. I, I was always an, an avid reader, I mean, uh, definitely drawn in by storytelling and the fact that I think, you know, growing up in Haiti, um, you, some of us, if you were lucky enough to go to school, you go to a very rigorous program in school and so that it's not, people weren't even afraid to, to give you a big book if you were able to read it. So I remember, you know, before I was 12, like reading Victor Hugo or reading Emile Zola and those kinds of stories. Because if you could read them, you read them. Nobody mm -hmm. said, oh, this is too old for you or this is too young for you. Um, so I just, I read everything I could, I could find. So I think that also, you know, that feeds your desire for stories. And I think a writer is interested in, in, in stories. And if you're lucky, you can be a writer without ever um, reading maybe, but I think it's the one thing that that feeds that interest in you if you start reading early. When, when do you write? Well, I write, I'm, if I'm lucky, I, I write all the time, but I find it easier to write at night because of, you know, there's something about the night, I think that just fades out everything else and allows easier you know, it allows it for you to imagine. And I always feel like allows the spirits to find me, these characters that are like ghosts, you know, to find me. And, um, you know, in, in the book, The Color Purple, at, at the end of the book, Alice Walker writes, you know, she thanks the characters for coming. And I just feel like, sometimes I feel like, for me, the characters travel at night. They don't, you know, because there's just too many people walking around in the daytime to, in their way. It's like, they're like ghosts, you know, they find you at night. So I find it easier to write at night. But once I get started, if I'm inside a story, I just, I, I, I feel like it's a trance, like I can't stop, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'll stop to eat. And when I, you know, if I, when I was living by myself, I was just kind of like, I would do that, it would be a month, like people wouldn't see me, I would just do it. But, um, now it's so like if you have more interactions, if you're, you know, you're, you have to stop. So that sort of 
life st puts that uh -huh. in your way that you have to sort of these structures. But um, when I'm when I'm when it's really going well, I just feel like I'm writing all the time. And even when you're not writing, sometimes you're writing because you're uh -huh. you're thinking, thinking about it. You're outlining things. Uh -huh. You can be in the shower and things are coming. So. When I'm lucky, I'm always writing, even if I'm not sitting down mm -hmm. somewhere with a pen. Do you have uh, at home, and, and do you have a special spot where you sit and write? Oh. Yes, I try to have a, a special spot. The last couple of years, my sort of I've been have different shifts, so my my spot has been shifting. But it's the most comforting thing for me. Like there are people who kind of dream of going to a beautiful place, looking at an ocean to write. I find it very difficult to not be around my things, you know, in some ways. Like if I'm writing, I want to be able to reach for a book that I know exactly, you know, I can reach without even looking. And so I like to have that sense of familiarity around me, but still have quiet or still have, you know, so I have, I try to carve a little place like that wherever I am or if I'm on the road or, or even if I'm at home, I, I definitely have a room at home, but it wasn't always so, you know, because I grew up, I have three brothers, and, and when I was growing up, I would just wait for everybody to fall asleep, and, and that's, thus comes this habit of writing at night. Do you write on several projects at a time, like several books, several manuscripts at the same time, or mm. you take it one by one? Yeah, I feel like I have to do it one by one. Um, I can do short, if I'm doing an article or something, but really things just occupy me totally like I, I can't do many things at the same time but in an early stages if I'm researching something um, then I could do several things but even even just it's hard to even do life things you know like when I'm really deep in writing I find it even hard to do my laundry so I can't I just I have to just give it all one thing mm -hmm. oh you write like uh, do you have a specific audience when you're writing? Are you thinking about a specific audience? Because I know you write, you read by everyone in the world almost, and uh, do you, when you start, do you target a specific audience? Mm. Well, you? it's a very, it's a, that's a, a question that comes up all the time, and it's, I mean, it's a very valid question. For me, when I write, I, my audience is really, several faces I think about and I think it's less intimidating to think about a lot of people but you think about a couple of people one the first person I think of I think of the girl I was when I was 15 and it's really true I think of this girl who was in the Brooklyn Public Library looking for books about you know Haitian Americans and looking for those books so I think of that and I think of my brothers two of my brothers um, and my family the two of us who were born in Haiti two of us who were born here and I think of my you know my brothers who don't necessarily they don't read French they don't read Creole but they're very you know they they grew up in this very very vibrant Haitian household and and speak Creole but they don't read it and so I think of them and and I think of writing for them and for their, you know, for my nieces and nephews and other people. So it depends on, with each book I'll think of one specific person. You know, for example, now I'm writing a, a little book for, another book for kids about Anna Kaona, who is sort of our great, um, you know, a name that's called often in Haiti, who was a Taino leader um, from the, about the same region that my family's from in Haiti, from Leogan. And so when I was writing about Anna Kaona, I, was, I, you know, I thought about my, my niece who was born last year. You know, her name is Zora. You know, she's named um, for Zora Neale Hurston. And so I'm, I'm thinking of, like, of her reading that when she's in, you know, when she's 10 and thinking about Haiti. Mm -hmm. and so I always think with each one, I think, you know, they have a kind of specific, um, what we, you know, pangin or mangin or somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, if I could give that person a gift, like I thought when my niece was born, I thought if I can give her a gift, you know, being born in the year 2003, this is what I would give her. So this is really, I think of audience as like really one person at a time. Uh, would you consider yourself uh, a miserabilist? Uh, I mean uh, that you write about pain, about uh, struggles, people's struggles, the you know different sort of uh, painful things. Mm -hmm. Well, Memories, I hope uh, I hope I'm not a miserabilist, um, but you know. But then I think of other, you know, I think of like they're going back to like Emile Zola and and stories. Um, of, of writing about people's daily struggles, and I think it's something that I that I tr 
struggle with all the time myself in the sense that, you know, coming, coming from Haiti, which, as we know, has this very powerful culture, has this great beauty and this amazing things, but also has this very painful history. You know, this year, 2004, we're celebrating the bicentennial of Haitian independence, and it's almost, you know, there's almost like a series of plagues, even if we talk about things that are happening right now today with these, um, these floods that are made even worse by the environmental situation, that then will worsen the, the situation. And, and I just remember thinking the other day when the flood started and somebody said, oh, there's an earthquake on top of this flood, you know, and you just feel like, you know, this like this series of, you know, just miserable circumstances that's balanced with all of that. And so I, I, I don't feel like I'm making a choice, like a necessary choice to highlight certain things. But for me, I've always had this balance around me. You know, I've always known that there's this balance. But, I, but in some ways, I think there's something about maybe my character where so I'm drawn to this other part of it. You know, I'm drawn to these things. These are the things that compel me to write you know, these more painful things. And I think in, in, in drama, in the act of creation, anyway, this, in this genre, in fiction, you know, in plays and other things, there is that intent, you know, built in, there is the conflict, you know, and, and we come from this, this history with so much conflict, you know, dramatic conflict, you know, sometimes things that you couldn't make up. So it's, um, I think it's just, I feel like my, just my work is just, drawn to that conflict and it seeks to explore to understand that you know the more difficult part of of Haiti which is then balanced with you know and some with stories like stories of Anna Kauna which and its beauty too is a story of conflict because in mm -hmm. the end she's this woman who fought you know it was just like the last woman fighting but was was hung at the end mm -hmm. you know and m the, you know the, the first of many people killed in this way in this mm -hmm. country so I feel like that's the side that that draws me, not to say that there's not also this, you know, the other things like carnival and, and, and things I've written about paintings and other things, but in the genre that I write, you know, this is, these are the things, these are the conflicts that I'm seeking personally to understand, which then makes their way into, into the fiction. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, the Grand Dame of uh, the Haitian literature, Paulette pujol oriol said, Happy stories do not make good novels. God uh, bless her for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you? Uh, well, you just. I guess you just answered the question. Do you pick themes? You know, or do you feel compelled to write? You know about the realities. I mean, uh, you had just. Yeah. No. I mean, because I mean, I, I I completely agree with that, and I think the conflict only comes in our case. You know, where people will say to a novelist, you know, someone who writes a painful story, why don't you write a happy one, you know? Uh -huh. That only comes because we have so many unhappy stories in life that people sometimes, they want you to write this, um, you know, sort of these pleasure plays in a way. But, but that's, you know, that you, can't, you can't really have a story without some conflict. And so there's always, there would always be some kind of obstacle to fight anyway in any in any kind of story that wasn't anyway an interesting story. Even if you think of, you know, the folk tales we told, other songs, you know, this, the you know Fiat la Lo con Majeti Moon, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know all the you know the, the Toto Marcus, all the even our you know it goes back to the Brothers Grimm. And if you put these things in our stories, you know, even children's stories, children's stories that are honest with children mm -hmm. have um, very dark conflicts. Mm -hmm. Uh, some speak about what they see, uh, you know, sort of uh, divine inspirations. When uh, you write, you say you light candles and you pray. Uh, do you feel uh, divinely inspired? Well, I think, you know, it's, um, in some ways it's giving what we do too big a place, but I, I do think there's a kind of, um, when things are working well, it's like you're a vessel. You're just, you're just, um, some things are coming through and it's like, with, you know, with the, with the epigraph with Alice Walker saying, thank you, thanking these characters for coming. Mm -hmm. I think in all creative acts, you know, there's a kind of magic or mystical mm -hmm. thing that we don't understand ourselves. Because even sometimes if you, 
when you reread certain things, you know, it's happened to me that people in my family will say there will be something in the stories and in the book, and they will say, how did you know that? You know, this happened mm -hmm. when you were born mm -hmm. and nobody talked about it. And Amy Tan, you know, the, the um, Chinese-American writer talks mm -hmm. about that in her family, things like that, where people, you know, would ask her, well, how did you know that? And some, you know, and maybe there are imprints, you know, there are some things that subconsciously, you know, are part of your being that you know. And I think uh -huh. of this example of, you know, there's a, you know, I'm obsessed with butterflies. You know, there's the, the example of the monarch butterfly, which is this butterfly that just makes this trek across the country, but it dies when it gets where it's going. And it just, it, it cocoons, you know, they have their, their butterfly offsprings, uh -huh. but they die. And then the offsprings go back. And they know the way, you know, to mm -hmm. go back. Mm -hmm. And I think of that as sort of this extraordinary example and that sometimes maybe in all our DNA there are some stories that are just imprinted, you know. And, and so I, I, I think we're every, you know, if, you, if somebody told you to dance outside naked in the rain to get closer to that, you would, you know. It's just that there are ways that think we all, that's the act of creation. That's why writers drink or take drugs or whatever and do other things. You know, we're all trying to connect to that bigger thing that we don't understand, like how does mm -hmm. this story come to you and why does it come some days and it doesn't come some other days. So it's like that mystery of it, I think, and, and being also coming where we come from, you know, where you sort of, you just feel sometimes a little closer to the spirits. You know, you're always trying to, you're trying to understand that or at least to, to remain favorable so that at least they'll, they'll come to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you seem to be profoundly attached to Haiti. Uh, why is that, since you left at a very early age? Well, I think part of it is because I didn't leave of my choice. I didn't leave of my own choosing. I think uh, it's something I've thought about over time, and, and it was a really sh a big shock for me, this mm -hmm. departure, you know. And I was at an age where I could, you know, I had some attachments aside from my family that were my own. So leaving... You know, just one day being told you had to leave and suddenly you have to go, I think, is the thing that sort of, I always wanted to go back and writing is one other way of going back. And so I think this attachment comes from that, you know, from the sort of, the pool of that, of that departure, you know, and we have um, um, a, a young man, Asoto Saint, who, who was a, a performance artist, a writer in New York, who um, was a dancer and he actually, he talks about, there's a poem that he, he has a poem where he talks about losing his childhood, you know, on the plane between Port-au-Prince and New York City and just feeling like in this, in this vessel, you know, in this mm -hmm. machine, he just became another person and he, it was this kind of schizophrenia, you know, where mm -hmm. part of your life is left here and then this other part of you starts from the day you arrive here and so I, I think that attachment is is I just felt like I just, you know, I always had that feeling when I left, you know, that I was like one more day, you know, I wanted one more day. And every time I go back to Haiti, it's like trying to get that, that one more day there. Mm -hmm. um, family, you, you, very important to you. And the birth of your niece or nephew uh, have, uh, made uh, an impact on your life and uh, how, do, how do you explain that? Well, well you know I was, um, I was 30 when my, my first niece was born and she was the first grandchild in my family and I remember um, I wrote an essay about her birth uh, for um, Essence magazine because it was really it was really this extraordinary event in my family um, because we it was as if, you know, we had the two, this was the child of my brother who was born, who was with me in Haiti, and then we had, I have two brothers who were born here. So this was really the first, our first American child, you know, like her, her mother mm -hmm. uh, is from Jamaica, and so it's like, she just came, it was like she came out of this soil, and the fact, I think it was profound for all of us that she would have been a different child or a different thing if my brother had stayed in Haiti, so it was really, impactful for all of us and there was my mother who who was saying well will this child speak Creole you know and and what does that mean you know this sort of this family mm -hmm. moving in this other direction and so I think it gave us all pause and it made us all think and especially for me too and 
and exploring that. And then my nephew was born, and it was the same thing, because he was then he was like the first male child of this the new generation. And then my other niece was um, born last year, and she's a, a different sort of a different being altogether, uh, because she's sort of neither like these other two. She's kind of this really robust and strong child, and very forceful, you know, and and her. You, you know, and even just very young, and just you could tell she's going to have, you know, she bears the name of Zora Neale Hurston, as I, mm -hmm. as I said, and just has that spirit. And so I think it's, it just forces you to imagine these things, you know, even people who had been nurturing this dream of going back to Haiti, mm -hmm. um, you just now you realize, yeah, there's like now this whole other branch of the family um, that's very American. And so that, that gave me a lot of... Um, give us all a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, generations, I mean, being connected, relations to be, you know, between women, how do you, you know, explain that? Because it comes out a lot in your books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it goes back, I mean, a lot of it goes back to the personal. You know, I, I um, the fact that, you know, my family, my mother, my father left Haiti when I was two and my mother when I was four. And I grew up in a way surrounded by women who were not my mother, but who were, in each of their ways, mothers to me. So this very strong idea mm -hmm. of surrogate mothering and passing on and, and, and also growing, you know, with other children in the same situation whose mothers were in other places, who, who, whose mothers had passed on and other women I'd taken in. And so, for me, that line was very important, and I've always had this model, not without idealizing this, of very strong women who were, for you know, for different reasons, either because their husbands had been killed during the dictatorship or had to just take in take in this situation. But I would see their, you know, they would be this person to me, you know, who was this high, and they were giants, and and sometimes when they went out into the world, people didn't value them in the same way. So that. When I started writing, I, just, I naturally wanted to write about these kinds of women because I didn't see many of them in the things that I was reading. So for me, it was, it was that. It was a kind of an act of honoring, of wanting to, to honor women like that without idealizing, without making them, you know, too infallible. You know, just honoring that, but also explaining their complexity and, and examining that, looking at that and how they survive. Your style of writing, uh, I mean, it's simple, but yet powerful. Um, what do you do I mean, with the people, you know, we left behind, that particular uh, theme that you seem to write about all the time? Wh why is that? Well, I think my, my style is really modeled after very first experiences and stories and mm -hmm. just having an experience where someone tells you a story and you can take out of it what you want and in that way a story is like a gift and one thing that I noticed you know from hearing stories told when I was very young that a really good you know good or orator in the sense of an oral story will do three things for you you know the first thing is they'll just they'll make you, they'll just draw you out of your out of your daily experience, which mm -hmm. I think the Haitian storytelling, you know, with the transitional phrases mm -hmm. like team team, boishe, mm -hmm. creek, crack. So you're transitioning from your life to this other space. And then the storyteller, the really great storyteller, keeps you there. And, and you know, when you were, tell we were being told the story, if you were drifting off to sleep, or if there, there was a song, you know, and there were movements. It was like there was this kind of theatrical. And then the third aspect is that you always remember it at the end. You know, you remember it so much that sometimes you want to pass it on. So I try to model that same thing in the stories that I'm, you know, that I tell in the, the simplicity without, you know, so that you always, you're just wrapped up in the, in the story. And that the story is something to pass on because, you know, the idea of thinking of the people we, we left behind of the things we left behind because a lot of us when we came here you know when my parents came and when others came or when I came you know there was there's a limit to how much you can bring you mm -hmm. know you can bring mm -hmm. two suitcases mm -hmm. 70 pounds each you know <laughs> so you can't bring your your chaudier your big <laughs> you have to improvise some people do <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I know. I had to bring one for somebody one time. But, um, but you bring, the most of what you bring really are your memories, you know, are the things that you remember and, the, and, and what you do with them. And really, I think those are the things that sustain people. So really, I feel like that's always the underlayer of my work. Like, these are the things that I was able to bring with me, you know, embellished by things that I've experienced here, of course, but, you know, these are also the things that I would want to leave, you know, when I leave this, this stage of my existence, you know. Are you a feminist? Yes, wow, yes, I am definitely a feminist. Wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think enough young women, I think people often say, you know, I'm a feminist, but, or, you know, mm -hmm. and I think young women these days are a little bit afraid to say that they're feminists, but I'm, yeah, I'm definitely a feminist and a, and a womanist in the Alice Walker sense, um, you know, of, you know, a feminist and also, you know, acknowledging the specific elements of, of feminism in different parts, parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, Haitian women, especially poor Haitian women, but, oh, you know, Haitian women have always been feminists. Yes. You know, have, have mm -hmm. lived, have lived the feminism you know, mm -hmm. without um, much, you know, theorizing about it, without much, you know, talking about it, but have lived a very strong, you know, feminist Before existence. Before the time, like, uh, we've always practiced proto-feminism. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, in, in many cases, not having a choice, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, so I, I think, but, but you will find many younger women, or I mean, younger Haitian women who would be, afraid even if they're living a very feminist life, you know, would be afraid to say they're feminist because there's this sometimes this interpretation, even women, young women here, that that means you hate men and certain things, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but um, I'm definitely a feminist. And actually, these, um, I had um, a friend sent to me, someone from Ms. Magazine sent to me, I'd requested it because they had their, for the march, the women's march, they had made these shirts that says, this is what a feminist looks like, mm -hmm. so that, you know, every, you could, when you wear your shirt, then they'll, they'll see um, the different faces of feminism. Oh. Now, personal pain, um, you know, of not being allowed to go to Carnival, and yet now uh, after many years you return and you wrote uh, about Carnival. Tell me about this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I wrote a little book about Carnival called After the Dance, and um, and it was really, I mean, it was a great experience writing that because this was something that I always wanted to do when I was a kid, go, you know, to go to carnival. But the way it was, too, because, because I was being raised by my, my, my uncle was a Baptist minister, and during carnival, we would, um, we would go to the country and work the land. And this was his, um, his way of teaching us, too, that, you know, you know, well, other people are sort of experiencing this pleasure, you can contribute, you can, you know, we have prayer meetings and, and, and different things like that. But, and I just, and like everything else that's forbidden to you, you know, you, and you want to experience it. So um, a couple of years ago I had this opportunity to write this book, you know, after, to, and they said, you know, you, uh, uh, it was a book of walks by writers. And so they asked me where I want to walk, and I said, and without a doubt, I said, I want to go to a carnival. And so I started, um, I started writing this book. And it was really a, a fun book to write because it, it was my first nonfiction book. So it was working in this other kind of genre and doing, doing all this research that was a lot of fun. So it was really a great, a great experience. Now, about funerals, mm -hmm. you know, you were like forced to be at funerals uh, every day wearing the same white dress. Uh, how does that, um, memory-wise, how, how is this affecting you now, these days, you know, or in your writings? Well, my uncle, again, the minister, because we were sort of the core, like the minister's family, and, and in some ways an extension of his, of his life, so we would, you know, he and his wife and my brother and me and, and my cousins, we would have to go to, to all the funerals. Strangely enough, we didn't have to go to the weddings he presided over. <laughs> we weren't invited to those. But the funerals, we had to go as a family to show our respects a lot. And I had a funeral dress, you know, and that I wore to all the funerals. And um, it gave me, I mean, going to those funerals, it gave me this really, I had to, to not be afraid of this process, you know, of, of which was a very 
in, in you know aspect of deep aspect of my life not to be afraid I had to kind of develop a philosophy early about death which um, which sounds you know it sounds scary but it wasn't because it made me really at ease with it and really it became this thing that was like um, you know like St. Augustine says like death is just like another door to another room and and I had you know because you see it you know having seen it so much you know the funeral the burial and all that so it became easy to think about death or at least easier to think about this idea that is a kind of transition and I really you know just balancing all the beliefs that different people had of it of course my my uncle's you know the Judeo Christian belief that you know this person was that's their body and that they were going somewhere else and mm -hmm. and also you know um, the, the other ancestral beliefs that this was like one stage of their life was over but that they were still around and and just balancing everything somebody said about death for example was helpful to me being at these funerals because it made it you know it, it just made it something else that you do and, and I've gone back now to funerals you know when my aunt who raised me she died uh, last year in February when I went back and I was I would look at the children at the funeral you know they had like the children's choir because she was the minister's wife who sang there and the children didn't seem afraid there, if anything there's a kind of curiosity that I vaguely remember in myself and seeing what someone you had seen, you know, walking mm -hmm. around, what they look like now, and this kind of peaceful look on their face. So I think that gave me this sort of fascination mm -hmm. with death that then comes through the work. And even in the carnival book, you know, it starts, it starts in a cemetery. And I'm, and I'm very intrigued by cemeteries. Mm -hmm. You said that you've yeah. always been, uh, you enjoyed cemeteries. <laughs> Is that some sort of a connection with the past? I, I think so. I mean, I think it's sort of, you know, in the, in, in the way that um, in the book, when I go to the cemeteries, you know, when I would talk to people about cemeteries, and they would say, you know, this, um, this proverb that, you know, people don't have, you know, you don't own any real house except where you're buried, you know, except of your, your cave, your mausoleum. I mean, that's the only house you really own, you know. And so this idea of, you know, these cemeteries and, and walking around a cemetery in this, you know, this the vibes that I feel, you know, that you just feel are this kind of idea that you know that this is everybody's last place. I mean, that's always, um, it sounds gory, but it's intriguing to me. But it's not gory in the sense that if you go to Haiti um, in some places, when I was writing the book too, in the, the section about cemeteries, there's a place um, up in Cap Rouge in the mountains of Jacques Mel where they have the most extraordinary uh, mausoleums. And oftentimes the mausoleums are so, you know, in Haiti people have in the country they'll have the house and then the the, mm -hmm. the grave right, right behind. in the backyard yeah exactly mm -hmm. and so but in Kapuz they were the most extraordinary ones like the house would be very simple but the the mausoleum you know behind there would be so extraordinary and some of them looked like they were just like these Middle Eastern um, tombstones and, and just influences that was hard to trace and so um, those kinds of connections and why you know, they, that, there's an easiness with death, too, when you think about that this person lives here. And I, we've had instances where we know friends who buy land from somebody when the family is no longer there with the one condition that they keep the grave there. You know, like, I'll sell you the house or sell you the land, but, you know, you just have to kind of make, you know, just make the space. Like, you can't un, just mm -hmm. unearth a cemetery, mm -hmm. or somebody's mm -hmm. mausoleum or tombstone. So that whole... I think transition this feeling with with death, which is which I think we all have, you know, as as a people, a lot of us have anyway. But for me, just started that with the church at these funerals and just continues. And I think will make it makes it a lot easier for me to accept that, not any less painful, but sort of a lot easier to accept that transition when it happens in my own life. You know, when I lost my aunt, for example, or mm. when when I when I lose people who are close to me. The farming of bones. This happened in, happened in 1937, way before your time. I know you are very much interested in history, and why did you pick this particular subject? And I know you did a lot of research, but... Uh, well, that was, uh, that was one of those other subjects I feel like that calls you. And... Um, 
When I was growing up, you know, I knew a lot, I'd heard a lot of, about a lot of people who had gone to the Dominican Republic to cut sugarcane. And then years and years later, I was working um, in a production office and met this artist at who, whose grandmother had survived this massacre and he had painted something, um, he had painted this, her survival in this very simple but graphic way. And it was a picture of the river with the trail of blood and he wrote, my grandmother told me that the Massacre River ran with blood. Mm -hmm. And the Massacre River is um, a river that's between Haiti and Dominican mm -hmm. Republic and it's called that not because of this massacre but because of a massacre between French and Spanish mm -hmm. um, colonizers. And um, so I, that painting just brought that back to me and then I started researching the story and had found out, you know, like that there was never any commemoration of this massacre. And I find that even today, you know, young Haitians don't know about that it, but young Dominicans, a lot of them do, like they know about it. But a lot of young Haitians don't know about it. So I started writing the story, but I wasn't sure how to approach it. So I wrote a, a story, um, a sort of a mother-daughter story that's in Kikak and with the, at the beginning, and then it just broadened the subject for me, and I had a character. Once I had this character, Amabel, who's the, lead in the in the book once i had that story it sort of broadened you know just she came with this whole history with this whole past that then merged this very complicated history between haiti and the dominican republic and this massacre that happened you know in 1937 two three days where 40,000 people were massacred by mm -hmm. um Tuohio, who was the dictator there for 31 years and so it's it was something that one of those things i did always haunted me and I just didn't know what to do with for many years and but once this character came you know sort of guided me through through the whole of the book but it was interesting um, now people do tr you know they'll read that and they read more about this period this massacre because there were always are other massacres happening around the world at that time it was the time of Hitler uh -huh. the time of uh -huh. you know all these other horrible things were happening in the world so for me it fit in with that whole line of massacres in the same way that you could put the massacres 10 years ago in Rwanda and Burundi within the lines of the massacres in Bosnia and Croatia because you know these things are isolated but sometimes our stories you know our things are just you know just dwarfed in the larger one are lost and that if that not that these lives aren't as important but they become buried mm -hmm. and unless they're told in this other way and people just learn about them almost accidentally you know if you read a novel then oh then you learn something and then you you research more I have, uh, having written all those stories about the past memory and and pain do you feel this has uh, hardened you a little bit or, or what makes you cry for instance I mean while you're writing this thing, do, do you feel like crying? Or what, or what makes you cry, really? That's well, they all, I mean, I feel like, you know, in some ways, these words are my tears. I mean, that's, that's how I cry. Um, the, the massacre, you know, writing about 1937 was somewhat difficult. Um, and I would have to stop sometimes because there were few stories, but the ones you had were so graphic. Mm -hmm. So um, I cry this way. I cry by writing these, these stories. You've been called one of Haiti's most um, distinguished ambassadors. How do you feel about that? <laughs> what kind of responsibility do you think you have toward you know, Haiti? And well, I think we're all in some ways ambassadors um, of Haiti. There are many. I don't give myself that role solely, you know. I think, um, you know, I grew up in a household where, like my mother would say, you know, when you leave this house, you represent Haiti, so you better comb your hair and dress proper because you might be the only Haitian somebody's ever met, you know. And so that was from the time we were all 14 and then mm -hmm. so so I had that you know we all had that role and you know in our different um, lives so I'm, I'm grateful I'm extremely grateful for the for this Haiti has given me this you know it's given me this very 
these rich stories and um, and in some ways all I'm doing is passing them on you know in the same way that when you're young you're told the story and you're itching to pass it on and what I hope is that other people you know when you read when they read these books then they'll be eager to read other things that they'll go out and find out more and realize the complexity of this country the complexity of this history and if that's an ambassadorship I accept that I accept that fully, you know, but that's the only way I can do it. I can't get to the United <laughs> Nations. <laughs> you never know. Now, what, uh, at the Festival of Cannes, when they, when they called you or wrote to you asking you to be a member of the jury, what was your reaction? Well, I was, I was very um, pleasantly shocked. So and it was it was extraordinary because I had this moment too where where they said you know they introduce you in front of the whole play and they said you know they say l'écrivain haïtien you know and they say my name and I was just really I was extremely proud and um, and like all these things I mean that's so th the great thing about when these things happen to you is that they don't just happen to me. And that, you know, I have like these school children in Jack Mill who saw it and who write to me and, and they said, you know, my teacher talked about it and then it becomes something bigger. I mean, so I think, I think that's really, that's the great thing about it. And we got to see a lot of great movies and I think we made a great choice in terms of the, the Palme d'Or. So I'm, I'm, it, was an, it was a great experience. I, I loved it. Well, we are celebrating 200 years of our bicentennial independence. And um, what are your wishes for Haiti for the future? Well, I think, um, I hope, you know, this is, we've had 200 very difficult years. And I think in some ways this is such a symbolic year. And everybody, we all knew, everybody knew it was going to be somewhat bittersweet no matter what. And that, you know, um, I hope this year, with all that's happened, um, no matter where people fall there, um, I hope it's, it becomes what's left of it a year of real, true reflection. And that in some ways, I hope Haiti doesn't, I hope we don't keep recycling these things, you know, these occupations, mm -hmm. these, um, this strife, these differences. And, and, um, and that my dream, you know, like, like all children of Haiti, I think, is that some way we were able to live the dream of our foremothers and our forefathers, to be truly independent, to be truly free, to, to come back to this place that gave us this republic because we needed to be united to, to fight this struggle, to create this country. And that, and that really, Haitians realize in the end that we can't move without the other. Like we can't, you can't have two Hades. You can't, we really have to be united. And true to the, cre you know, Credo, Lino Philafos, we really have to be united to have a future. You know, this country, is going to have a future, whether it's one that's more horrible than the past, or the w whether it's one that's a little better, we're going to have to have a future and we all have to, to try to build that future. Nobody's going to be able to do it for us. So I hope this year is, a, is really a year um, of reconstruction and that we stop these patterns of, you know, and stop and go of, of these, um, you know, we're occupied basically now. Yeah. And, you know, to to really re to, to, to rebuild a country that, that can face the world, really, the way we did 200 years ago, and not to stay and linger there, but to talk about it, because this is, you know, this is the bicentennial, but it gives us this opportunity, this symbolic place from which to begin another cycle, and I hope we take that and move on, you know, truly free, truly united, and truly um, together, so that we can have a, a, a future. And you feel that people in the diaspora, the Haitians, could really help in the reconstruction of Haiti? We should all put or join together. How, how do you think this can be done? Well, I think I think the I think it's important that the people in the diaspora are part of the conversation. And I, and I always tell people when you go back, I think if they go back with humility, without um, just stumping their way in, and mm -hmm. just going back with humility and and they can make a contribution and they can actually in some ways I think the diaspora's 
can be a kind of bridge um, between sometimes in very you know uh, polarized situations mm -hmm. you know they can be a bridge in this in this type of conversation um, all country like all places you know all countries have this where the diaspora comes back in some ways and and helps to rebuild I mean they can't be the sole factor you know but they can in some ways help in this rebuilding but I think there one has to go we have to go with humility with with the idea of working together and a lot of people are doing that we have to acknowledge that um, a lot of people are doing that in their own small community mm -hmm. you know we we know people who have built schools um, in their own small communities but in a way to join these efforts so that they they can have more impact mm -hmm. now to do break uh, your most recent book um, just tell us about it Some well, the do breaker. How did you come to write the do breaker? Mm. Well, I started the the do breaker is a series of um, connected short stories, and um, it ranges from the time of the the Duvalier era from 1967 to today, 2004 actually, um, and it's a series of connected short stories. And the do breaker is a character who worked, who was a torturer in a prison in Haiti, and now is a barber in Brooklyn. And each of the stories. Um, links one person who whose life he affected so I started writing it one story and then all these other stories came um, to it and the title of the Dubriker comes from you know the expression Shuket mm -hmm. Laouze who's mm -hmm. someone who stomps and um, shakes to do well what is your next project well I mentioned a little bit um, mm -hmm. it will come out next spring it's a it's a book for for children called um it's about mm -hmm. Anna Kaona oh, who yes, is the see. Taino uh -huh. leader and so that's um that's the the next one and I'm still you know I my next next is um is percolating hopefully someone something will come and someone that's my Freudian slip someone or some inspiration will find <laughs> me yes Okay, uh, thank you, Edwidge. It's been a real pleasure and an honor to interview you. And uh, I also thank uh, the University of uh, California in Santa Barbara. It's, I'm sure it's a great pleasure for them to have you. Thank you. Thanks. It was great chatting with you. <laughs>